How about we go ahead with a word of prayer before I read the text? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Leon and the songs he picked tonight. We thank you that we can count our blessings. And one of our blessings is that we can come here and worship you. <coughs> and it's safe on our way here. Nobody's stopping us. Nobody's getting in our way and telling us to go back home. We thank you for our friends that we get to see here who are brothers and sisters in Christ and who have been with us all along. And we thank you for full salvation deeper than this thing has gone. In your name, amen. I'm going to grab a stool just like I did last time. It just makes me feel a little more comfortable and at ease. And it makes me feel like I'm not standing above you. <laughs> Micah 3, 1 through 12 is tonight's text. Micah 3, 1 through 12. And before I read, Micah is a minor prophet, we know that, but he lived in Israel in a time when Israel's people were being ripped apart, they were being taken and used for building projects the way that Israel did. And not many people in the nation, whether it was the rich, powerful kings or the rich were powerful religious elite. They, they didn't care about the plight of the people. That's just a little bit of the story of Micah and why he was called by God to come to ministry. Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, if one feeds them, they proclaim peace. If he does not, they prepare to wage war against him. Therefore, night will come over you without visions, and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets, and the day will go dark before them. The seers will be ashamed, and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces, because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to proclaim and declare to Jacob his discretion, the transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bride, her priests teach for a price and their prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. No one in American history <coughs> has more eloquently addressed the idea <coughs> and need for justice than Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King was a preacher and civil rights leader. In Montgomery, Alabama, he said to 5,000 people in the sweltering heat, there comes a time, my friends, when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time, my friends, when people get tired of being plunged across the abyss of humiliation, where they experience the bleakness of nagging despair. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing among the piercing chill of an alpine November. There comes a time. With his voice, Dr. King prophetically 
discredited the lie of white supremacy, liberating the children of former slaves and former slave owners to really live into what it means to be God's children and coming to him through God's reconciling justice. Dr. King bequeathed to all of us a prophetic gift, showing us what it is to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord and God's justice, declaring God is full of mercy in the pursuit of restoring all people to living free in God. Micah is too emboldened with the justice of God. He is able to perceive God's justice. Micah is from the south of Jerusalem, from a little village called Moresheth. The hem of his tunic is unstitched, and the tip of his toes peer out of the top of his sandals. His skin is leathered and brown from the hours spent in the brutal sun while plowing and tilling the fields and farming in Moresheth. Micah sees the drafty and crumbling houses of the impoverished. He remembers that at one time, Moresheth was full of green vegetation. The rulers in Jerusalem now have a monopoly on all the raw materials needed for building and construction. The poor farmers in their land have no more resources and no more wood or grass to offer Jerusalem. So the people of Moresheth have no resources for making hosing repairs. His neighbors are cut off from communicating with a family and their friends. Micah goes up to Jerusalem. He wants to make clear to those leaders that the people, the people of God are being oppressed. When Micah enters Jerusalem, he is riding on his donkey and he sees the shiny marble houses with their lush green homes. Rugged and scruffy, he looks out of place next to the finely tailored leaders in Jerusalem. Micah furrows his brow in <coughs> standing in fearless protest before the oppressive ruling elite. And he candidly approaches them as a farmer tills rocks rocky soil. He dispenses with the pleasantries and he is very indelicate in his gruesome analogy. He says, hear me, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? You who hate good and love evil. I don't know what Mike is going to, going to say next. He's leading into something very, very traumatic for the people of God. So what is he going to say? He says, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin away from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones into pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. In verse 3, Micah the prophet uses the Hebrew word gozale, which means to flay, to peel, and to fillet like filet mignon. Yeah, we get the point. Micah is really being gruesome and telling the leaders of God's people, you are cannibals. And indeed, all of these are identifiable with the grisly acts of people eating people. The leaders of Israel are devouring God's people. Every punishment that awaits the cannibalistic false prophets and unjust king fits their crimes. Clearly, the leaders are in it for the money. They desert their responsibility to God's people. So God is deserting them. The people of Israel are devastatingly divided because these leaders have nothing but depraved indifference towards the poor. Micah is identifying with the boiling anger of God and with the enslaved poor when he prophesies to the false prophets who came that the day will be black over them. They shall be disgraced and put to shame. God's denunciation through Micah is pronounced upon the king, the priests, and the false prophets who enrich themselves through extorting the modest incomes of the people who work for them. 
He insists that the detestable state of affairs for the poor in Israel is due to their corrupt and greedy leaders. The leaders who are subjects of God and to God need to stop living an ignorant life of God's justice and consequences. Specifically, these consequences are for when Israel's leaders are devouring the poor and not championing their cause, or not taking up the cause of the poor. The false prophets have the king's attention, enough to give him advice, and the result is a justice that is perverted. For example, when prophets <coughs> proclaim peace only when they are fed, and wage war on those who are not given the food they desire. Micah's voice is grand as it pierces the air. Hear this, you cannibalistic prophets and king who pervert justice and mingle all that is right. The leaders have led people astray because they turn to their own interests and not God's. It reminds me of the verse, and like sheep, all we should, like sheep have gone astray, and every one of us has turned to his own way. Isaiah 53, 6. This is where the drive for money and the exploitation is so intense that it crosses over into hatred and bloodlust, where the payoff stops being about money, and it becomes the search for something more and more evil, desperate. It is about winning, and winning through stomping over people and tearing them away from God's people. When power is not aligned to God's justice, the corrupt and unjust government becomes transparent under the glory of God, the sovereignty of God. Failure to love God distorts human judgment. Israel's leaders are impervious to this situation because they're selfishly greedy. Failure to love God distorts how we see each other. Micah is preaching to us, and we are Micah preaching to the world. The message is of God, the vigilant king, who acts in behalf of his people providentially. There are people who are being swindled out of land and home. It seems that people are not interested in advocating for the causes of the poor. How do we know when God cares? Does a just God exist anymore? <coughs> Recently I had the opportunity to go to Israel with some other students from Calvin Theological Seminary. And we saw sites like the Garden of Gethsemane, the foothills of Golgotha and Calvary and the tomb. Great sites, great sites. But we also went to Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem isn't like it when David was living or Jesus Christ was born and the Magi going to see Jesus at two years old. No, no, no. There's a wall, all right? There's a wall that runs and separates the Jewish people folks from the farmers and from the Palestinians. And there are a lot of Palestinian Christians who love God there. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I have seen it firsthand. And they're cut off by the state of Israel. This is not to poke fun or to bring down the state of Israel because each nation is sovereign under God. But this, this wall has some complications here. And the story is this. There were some friends of ours that wanted to go see Ten of Nations, which is a summer camp, and it's an ecumenical summer camp in the truest sense of the word, okay? Palestinian Christians from all faith and creeds who say the Apostles' Creed but worship in an Eastern Orthodox Church or Pentecostal Church or uh, uh, a CRC Church. There are, there, there are some small Reformed churches, Presbyterian, churches. So what I'm saying is this family is Christian and the state of Israel had put concrete blocks on the driveway. And when we were coming in our tour bus, there was an ambulance winding its way up the road, the driveway, but there were concrete blocks with steel bars in front. That mean, and there was a, it's a mile drive up that driveway. That means the EMTs, the ambulance workers, had to walk walked up the driveway with us to the family and there are the Nassars. They had a website and where we ended up is at Tent of Nations. They also have a website under that if you want to Google it later. 
where it gives their story of their journey. And what the state of Israel will do after we got up there, we saw rocks painted colorfully with bright colors, very warming colors and inviting hospitable colors with, with verses about how to live among, among uh, each other with exploitation. And a friendly man in about his 70s, late 70s, Dahar Nassar welcomed us. And he shook all of our hands, and there was about 30 of us. Mm -hmm. And he says, welcome to the Ten of Nations. Do you know what the state of Israel has done? My family has owned this land for 100 years. I have certificates of ownership going all the way back when Turkey, when it was the Muslim Empire, ruled this land. And the state of Israel will take us to court each and every day. They will sum us to court to bring our papers with us. If we don't respond because we win the battle, they'll give us a blank check. And my friends and I were left scratching our beards like, what? They will give you a blank check? And we were asking, is this for a thousand? Is it for 2,000 American? No, this is for any amount of American I want to write in. And they will move us with visas and passports. We'll get our passports in six days and our visas in six months. It's called fast tracking. It takes longer than that, usually. So my friends and I were like, you can write a million American dollars in there and sell this land. Ten million, Rob. Ten million. Even higher if we want. We, we prayed as a government. Because this family loves the Christian creator God. And for me, I'm used to the other side where it's the state of Israel and they, and they have their rights, but they have the right to treat other people with respect and dignity as well. And they put the state of Israel putting up a wall and trying to get folks to sell their farmland is just wrong to me. And so Dahar Nassar goes back to uh, farming his land and his son Daru takes over and we walk with him past cherry trees and when we're walking to the cave that he's going to take us down we see where bulldozers have come in and they're Israel state owned bulldozers and they bulldozed crops of apricot trees just before they got ripe and he said if I was in Florida and sold these I could get $20,000 American for these apricots. That's how much he had. That shows how fertile the land is, too. And it's not just dry desert sand like we commonly think as Romans. <coughs> this is near the Jordan Valley. Uh, so we walked down a cave with Dawood, Dahar's son. And it's dark. There's not many lights because they have to fuel. They only have solar energy. They don't get a running supply of water, fresh water from the government, so they can really take a shower when they can. And before us, though, was a big table, kind of like in the elder's room, and there were urns of hot tea and cups waiting for us. And it was kind of cold that day. So we listened to our share about how he came to America and learned American constitutional government law, and he's prepared now better for his family to defend his land, but he wants to do it peaceably. He said the difference between my family and American people, like in Texas who want to defend their land, I don't pull guns on people here. Because they would shoot, what's the, what's the point? Mm -hmm. What's the point? And I was thinking of Micah, I was thinking of Micah. You know, those who wage war, those who wage war. But this family, they had, they had so much about the peace of God about them that I wondered if it could ever take root in a church there, in, in, in a bigger church outside of the family. But the, in, that, in that troubling midst, he shared with us about how he loves God. About how he loves Jesus, because Jesus is the one who gave himself for the hurting and for the poor and for the people of Israel. And also not for people in just America, but for people in Israel, people like him. And Micah is filled 
with that same spirit, Micah 3.8 says. Micah is filled with that same spirit and justice of the Lord to champion the cause of the poor. Micah's hope in God's justice defines what it means to be a person of faith. He is filled with the justice of God and the Spirit of the Lord. So see him stand out against the backdrop of wrongdoing of the cannibal false prophets and kings in Jerusalem. He cries out his vision to God's people. But as for me, I am filled with the power and the Spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Israel his transgression. Israel, his sin. Micah preaches that his inspiration is completeness and shalom. This is what separates him, Micah the prophet, from the rich kings and false prophets who are full of violence and deceit. He speaks the truth while everyone who leads the people of Israel are full of depravity. God is a place of justice in an unjust power structure. Micah sees God as a place of triumph amid the collapse of Jerusalem. Verse 8 heightens the Hebrew word mishpat, which we translate as God's restorative loving actions towards the poor and his people's deep fidelity to him. <clears throat> God is the ultimate judge whose fair and honest rulings lead to a cessation of injustice. Micah's vision is coexistence between the rich and poor. Justice to the poor is tied to the leadership in Jerusalem and the farmers in the small villages to the south where Micah is from. There is an agricultural image in his words, and Zion shall be plowed like a field, which illustrates that God's justice connects just Jerusalem to the agricultural villages that feeds all of Israel. Micah is the herald of the kingdom of the Lord to Israel's flock in Jerusalem. God is removing injustice from God's face. God never divorces judgment from promises of hope. Micah's perseverant hope speaks up for the poor, the fatherless, and the widow. This is what God wants to see his people do. So Israel must stop doing evil. Israel's leaders must learn to embrace, care for neighbor. All of this is established in loyalty to God. Justice and loyalty are the connective tissues in God's governance and sovereignty, sovereignty over creation. His is the opposite of what Israel's doing, tearing those connection tissues away. God wants to bring everything back together. God insists that he is the vigilant king who will plant his people in Israel's fertile soil in order to bring his people back to life. Micah skillfully plants the seeds that he is filled with the Spirit of the Lord and God's justice to proclaim release to those of God's people who are economically exploited. Micah's message is a God-given challenge to his people to move from being uninvolved to being involved and in advocating for the care of our neighbors. Jesus Christ is our chief prophet, the Heidelberg Catechism says. Why is he called Christ? There's a lot in there. But it says he is our chief prophet who constantly defends our cause before God. Micah's address and proclamation explicitly calls us to help those who are economically disadvantaged. God's justice is never blind to our lives. Jesus empowers the church to champion the cause of the poor. So what can individuals do? We can listen and be present. Because this reminds me of a friend I have here in Wyoming and, and similarly in Lansing. They both lost their jobs because they threw their back out while working. And then they were told to keep working. If they didn't, they would force a, face a charge of insubordination for not doing what management wanted. So they kept working, and when they got out, they went and saw the doctor, and there was the bad news. So both asked me, and this friend from Lansing is one of my childhood friends, and I went down and drove, drove from here to Grand Rapids, and one of the questions he asked me is, how does the church help me, Ron? I walk in and say I need help. I just don't want to hold anything back. I don't want to make my story bright and brilliant. I just want to give them the facts. How can I help? How can I be helped here? 
I threw my back out at my work and they let me go because I was rehabbing it too long. And the, he told me when I went and met him at a Big B down in Lansing that the church looked at him really weird. He's a father of four and he's married. And he, they looked at him strange. Like, hey Mike, why don't you have work lined up on your own? And he explained their, his case to him. And he was given just a voucher for, for a gift card at Meyer, and that's all that happened. And he's had bad experiences with the church before, and I'm left there at Bigby scratching my head about what do I do. And I had read this passage. It was just after I had gotten back from Israel, as a matter of fact. And uh, I just sat there and I said, tell me more. What could I say? Um, and then a friend here in Wyoming lost their job the same way. A little different sort of circumstances. So when we had coffee, he has a child and he's married. And he's had some bad experiences as well with the church. But I, I, I just sat and listened. I was there. I wanted to be present. I wanted to be a gift of God, bringing the gift of God, bringing Jesus to hurting people. And so after a while, I sat and I, I just said, can we pray? So we prayed, and then each time I directed their attention to Micah 3. And each time I was asked this question, isn't Micah a fire and brimstone prophet? I said, that's what you might think, but he's also a prophet of peace and restoration. So they quickly turned in their Bible, Micah 3. They started reading, wow. They skipped right to the end, like most of us want to do with a story. And they said, the temple's going to be a heap of rubble? That's my life right now, Ron. They really got attracted to the story of Micah. Because then, I know this sermon isn't on it, but in Micah 6.8, it, sa it says, What does the Lord God require of me? And that is to walk humbly with your God, love justice, and seek peace. They said, this guy is not a fire and brimstone prophet. He understands where I want to be. Peace. My children want peace. A stocked refrigerator cabinet. So they went, and, and, and each time I followed up with them, actually, they are seeking a church where they can get help. And the friend in Lansing has actually sought a church and found one. And praise God, he had the church is not sending him away empty-handed with a voucher. He, even though he had a gift card admired, he still felt empty-handed because he had physical needs, emotional needs, mental needs. So did his kids. He wanted to be a responsible dad. Who doesn't? But he also had spiritual needs. Micah helped him find that. And so what does this passage teach us today? For today, it teaches me that God really, really cares about people. He wants us to help people. Like we heard this morning about George Heath and some other folks who have the gifts of help. You know, that's all I did. I bought my friends coffee and I helped them through Micah, or the Holy Spirit did, but used me to help them. To find a church and not leave, not to give up on it, when they feel like they're empty-handed and left out. And all they want to do is work, their backs are better. Who doesn't want to work, right? So they needed truth with love. And they needed justice. They needed to know God still cares. A just God doesn't mean... <laughs> it means, let me take you and see where you're at right now. <laughs> and that's what Micah shares. And so that's what I wanted to share today. And thanks for letting me share. We also see that Jesus is the place of this. Jesus Christ, that's the only way I could tie it together with my friends. And that's why I'm tying it together tonight. Jesus Christ is the place of ministry to people who are hurting. And imagine if we didn't have a coffee spot or other places around us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty amazing that Calvary has that here. I've said it before, but I'll say it one more time, that God's grace is here because I can definitely bring my friends here and they would feel safe to talk to me just about anything they wanted to. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prophet Micah, who we often hear about. I mean, Micah's a name that might be around the church or outside of here. 
some of our friends might have that name, but we really don't understand what this book is about, but it can work wonders of grace for people who are hurting and feel detached and ripped away from a job, from money, from being there for their family. That's all they want that money for. They don't want it for anything else, just to make ends meet. We thank you for the message of hope and the message of justice tonight. We thank you for the day tomorrow where we can start to live this out. In your name, amen.